So I'm talking to Mick Scarlett, well-known uh, journalist, like <laughs> presenter, actor, and generally someone who's putting his spoke in the wheel to make things better for disabled people. So Mick, it's very good to have you. Very and nice to be uh, here. our theme, one of our two themes in Disability History Month in 2021 is disability, relationships and sex, something that a lot of people don't want to talk about, but I've heard you talk about a lot. So tell me, first of all, how your ideas about this were shaped when you were growing up uh, and from when you developed your impairment. Well, I was, I've always been disabled. I was born with cancer, so uh, which left me paralysed in one leg. Um, so I was the limpy kid at school right. um, and I wore a uh, caliper and I was, it was kind of weird because I was brought up with this kind of dichotomy in that one half of me was told, oh, you know, you'll never get a girlfriend and no one will ever want to be with you because you're disabled. And then the other half was kind of talking about me as a dad and talking about me, you know, going out and getting married. And so it was kind of a weird one in that we were in this, you know, I was in the society that told everyone to have kids and get married, but, but not for you, maybe. We're not sure, I don't know. And I didn't find any trouble finding girlfriends uh, when I finally hit puberty, I was quite a late developer. Um, luckily, because I hit puberty during punk. And so being the guy with a caliper, because I, I, I wore it on the outside of my bondage trousers and covered it in studs and straps. So it kind of made me cool. Um, and of course, there was Ian Jury in the charts who also wore a caliper. So it kind of become a fashion accessory. Um, but typically, uh, at 15, um, when I was in full, you know, hormone raging puberty, uh, my spine collapsed um, as a side effect of the cancer treatment that no one expected. And I suddenly become a wheelchair user. And that paralyzed my legs and also <laughs> took away the ability for me to get erections. So I genuinely thought that's it, game over. There will be no love for me. I will not have relationships. And um, I kind of started you have to kind of rethink your whole life, especially if you imagine, you know, my mum would permanently talk about me getting married and permanently talk about me having kids. Um, I later found out that the cancer treatment had left me sterile. So I was never going to have kids no matter what. But so I wish you hadn't gone on about that quite so much. Yeah. But um, yeah, so I kind of thought, well, this is not going to be for me. And then I thought, well, you know, how else can you find relationships? Um and I won't lie, I, I dallied with um, gay relationships because I thought that might work. But unfortunately, I am not gay. Mm. So that didn't work. Um, and then I started hanging around with a group of uh, lesbian um, sort of mates. Mm. Uh, and uh, I mean, there's actually a video of me telling this story for the BBC online if anyone wants to watch it. But basically, we were at a party. We were playing Truth or Dare. And I said truth and I told them they were my friends I thought they would uh, be very understanding instead they laughed and laughed and laughed and then sort of when I finished you know when they finished laughing and I was like oh why are you crying why, why are you laughing at me they they actually said well what do you think we do and I was like uh, oh yeah so uh so that kind of changed my life so um and I think that's also why I started thinking I, I mean for many years I didn't talk about it um, even, I mean, I became quite a well-known TV presenter. I was playing in a band, you know, since behind me. Um, uh, and I didn't talk about it, but I still wrote songs about sort of love and relationships. And there was always this kind of hidden side within them that, you know, things might not be what you expect to be. But then I decided that it was time to kind of come out because um, we don't talk about it in society. And I kind of got fed up with having to lie to all my friends because they, you know, um, men tend to talk about things like that in a kind of horrible and laddish locker room way. And I kind of joined in, in that kind of, ha oh, ha, yeah. Uh, and I remember one of my best mates at school who later came out as gay would talk about going with girls in a very similar way. And he had no idea what he was talking about. And it was very plain to us uh, uh, as we kind of, you know, gained experience that, what on earth was he talking about? And I kind of felt like I might be doing that. And also, I thought it was very unfair that I met other men who were going through the same thing and they weren't having as good a time, if you know what I mean. I, can't, I had really luckily adjusted to who I was. So I came out and I came out on sort of national television on a 
TV show <laughs> presented by Doya Wilcox, believe it or not. Um, and to be honest, that was the kind of mark of a, a when I started campaigning quite openly, not only about disability and sex, I mean, it's broader subject and the fact that we are sexual beings, but also the fact that sex is more than what you're taught at school. Um, and I think that was, uh, you know, that was quite important to me. And I've done it ever since, really, much to the, you know, an <laughs> embarrassment of my poor wife, uh, <laughs> who used to support me, but now is a bit more kind of, oh, can we, can we talk about something else now? <laughs> <laughs> so here I am again. <laughs> yeah. Ah, dear. Sorry, I, I thought I'd better let you get a question in, because otherwise I'll just right. talk well, solidly and you'll be like... So, <laughs> I mean, as men, one of, one of our problems is what we're brought up with is a, a very sexist portrayal of sexuality. And it's clear from what you were saying then that you already had to go in different directions because mm. you didn't have erections, but you could mm. make love in lots of different ways. Yeah. Um, do you think that also changed your attitude to women as well? Um, I think, I mean, I think it was more than that. I think I was very lucky. I, I uh, grew up during the blissful years. Uh, I mean, they were awful in many accounts and many reasons, but they were kind of great to be a teenager in the end of the 70s and the start of the 80s. Mm. So you'd got the end of punk and the start of the new romantic mm. phases. And, you know, we're in a phase now where, you know, young people are questioning gender and sexuality and, you know, identity. And we did that too. Hmm. So it meant that, you know, um, I, lots of my friends were gay or lesbian. Um, you know, I, I had trans friends even then. Do you know what I mean? So it's, um, and we all played with what sex was in a kind hmm. of way. So I wasn't actually that weird within that world. If I'd have been a football supporting, you know, normal kind of guy um i think it might have been much more of a battle um and i think that kind of you know the kind of people i was attracted to were also the kind of people that weren't going to be freaked out if you said oh we might have to do things a little bit differently tonight right. mm -hmm. um and so you know some yeah no some were you know it wasn't all good reactions some people didn't react well um you know and i think that there's a lot of stuff that disabled people can face um that the public don't really get, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that say, we'll go out with you and, and stay with you in a, in a sexual relationship, but kind of always imply that, you know, there's something better out there for them and that they're kind of putting themselves, you know, down and, and, and sort of making do with you. Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other hand, that happens to a lot of people who aren't disabled. Do you see what yeah, I mean? So I think the that, grass is always greener. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, I think, I think, I think there are people, you know, you know, in a way, I look back on some of my relationships and I think now they'd probably be called abusive because, mm -hmm. you know, we now class, you know, mental abuse as abuse. And so going out with someone that's disabled and then kind of going on about how wonderful you are for going out with, you know, you, oh, you little cripple thing, aren't you lucky to have me? Because, you know, most people wouldn't go out with you. It's just the same kind of abuse that other people who are abused would face. But you don't think about it at the time because you live in a society that tells you that that is the truth. And it's only when you meet someone that goes, I really, you know, it's not only that I don't care, I, I love you and being disabled is part of you. So, I, you know, I love all of you. And I think that's the thing. But then that's, the, again, one of the big things I think is that we as disabled people can sometimes think that we have a very different experience. And I think the thing is, is that everybody who isn't the same has a bad experience, whether you're larger or thinner or taller or shorter, whatever color you are, whatever gender or sexuality you are, you grow up feeling different. And I think that it, what we need to do is learn from each other and talk to each other and talk to the wider community. Because I know that I faced in my youth, a lot of things that my friends who weren't disabled were probably facing. Mm. Um, but because we didn't talk about it very much, uh, it didn't communicate, you know, we didn't know that it was a shared experience. And I think the community, disabled community does tend to go, this is because I'm disabled. I'm being dumped because I'm disabled. I'm being turned down because I'm disabled. And yes, there will be some of that, mm. but it's not just that. And I think, you know, that's really important to embrace. And I know that I did that early on. I, I, I decided to think that if someone said no to me uh, or, or, uh, you know, like 
occupied if you're going out a date no 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 not really okay i'd go right well that's because i'm disabled but if they said yes i'd kind of go right that's because i'm really good looking <laughs> <laughs> and i know it sounds and it's sort of silly but it kind of meant that that you could that you weren't always having your confidence shot down because i also believe that if someone says no to you because you are disabled then they aren't the right one for you are they because no. you are disabled do you know what I mean? And I think that applies to everybody. You know, I am tall, I am big, I am small, I am short, I am white, I am black. I'm where you are, you are. And these things cannot be changed. So and do you think so, yeah. a lot of people are we live in a world where, where we're continually bombarded with sexualized imagery, which is a, a very one-dimensional. It's maybe it's all right now to be gay, uh, you know, that's quite a, a sexy thing. And even some trans is now, yeah. RuPaul's yep. drag show and all, you know, but at the end of the day, people are, most people are still on a very narrow spectrum about what, what a sexual partner should be like. And what do you think, so putting the reverse on the question, how do you think disability works for, and this is, I'm sure you thought about this, but for women who are physically disabled? I think, do you know what, it's, 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 it's it, funny it, actually. It, I, did, it, uh, I did a documentary for mm. the BBC, it was a two-part documentary for the BBC, BBC Two, uh, and it was, what is it like to be disabled and want to find love? Mm. Um, and what we did was uh, I went out um, as a straight man, and then I went out with a friend who was gay, and we followed, you know, and we talked about our experiences, and we talked to other people, and then we had another show that was following the experiences of women. Mm. And basically, the gay guy and the straight women had a much worse time than the straight man and the lesbian girls. And basically, if you go with women, it's much better. Mm. <laughs> and that which because and that opens up a whole world of sort of psychology and sociology. You know, women are caring, nurturing, supportive, you know, men embarrassed to show that they might need to support their partner in that way. It's, it's, you know, there's a load of stuff going on. I do think it's got better and I also think that we can dwell on the bad news stories mm. but almost everybody I know who's disabled women men gay straight whatever are in relationships mm. and those that aren't almost all if I think about it pretty much all aren't because they don't want to be mm. there are some that do and go I don't know how to find anyone and everyone's horrible mm. but most people I know are in relationships and I think that Whereas most of the non-disabled people I know aren't. And they're really searching and it's really tough out there. So I think that it's, yeah, we, we, we are, it's a bit like when you're at school thinking everybody at school is the, like the bully, but the bully is the bully and everyone else either just keeps quiet because they don't want to get bullied or they don't really care or you're not their mate. And I think that that's sort of the same. There are always going to be people who go, Ooh, look at you. Ooh, don't fancy you, you weirdo. And that, but that's, you know, that's their problem. Um, and again, like I said, if they, if you say to someone, I, I, I fancy you, and they go, well, I don't fancy you because you're disabled. That's the best thing that anyone can say to you because it means that you're not wasting your life with someone who generally doesn't want to be with you. Yeah. So don't, I think it's really important that, that young disabled people don't fall into that trap of believing the stereotypical myth that most people don't fancy you. Because actually, those that don't, you don't want to be with. And there are many that will. And it's more about confidence and more about finding the thing you love. You know, um, when I popped up on the scene, you know, in the disabled community and in the media, I dressed like a kind of, you know, wheelchair using Billy Idol. I was all in leather and spiky hair. And, you know, it's still got some left, but it was more spiky yeah, yeah. and more blonde. And, um, you know, so because that was my look. And yeah. that look worked great with a wheelchair. And I was on the alternative scene. I went to all the goth clubs and the punk clubs and the new romantic clubs. So I looked great. And everyone there didn't really care. Some girls would go, yeah, no, I don't really think so. Not, I'm not into the thing, wheelchair thing. And you'd go, all right, cool. And yeah, so I then became friends. But mm -hmm. others would be completely disinterested. And I think that's it. Because I was on the scene with people. They knew I liked music. They knew I liked the things they liked. And so it wasn't a, a big deal. Um, and I think it can be too easy to, to, it's the big thing to blame. It's all about disability. Yeah. For some people it will be, but some people it might just be, I don't fancy you. And that's not a bad thing. 
people don't all have to fancy each other. Do you know what I mean? So if yeah. someone doesn't, and I think also that there are people who do fancy disabled people. Um, and we have whole have conversations about people that, that are kind of into disabled people tend to be called devotees. Mm. And some are weird and dangerous, but some aren't. And I think that, you know, that's a, a whole other topic of discussion. It's quite difficult to go into when we're talking about the fact that we don't want to use too much uh, sexy language, but it's kind of, I think that if, if, you know, if we always say everyone isn't into you, well, there's some people that are so much that they really are into you. So I think that, you know, we've got to see that it's a, it's a spectrum. And so the people that aren't into you and the people that are a bit weird and into you, whoa, there's most people are in the middle. And so I think that's the thing to remember. And yeah. that's, it's taken me quite a while to learn that. So that's my pearl of wisdom. But obviously you're, you're a really confident person. You probably always were, I should think. Uh, but you certainly exude self-confidence. Don't you think it's as much how you feel about yourself? Mm. And if you've bought into the negativity that society still puts around us, you're going to find it harder to, to make relationships with people because you don't feel you're worthy of it. I do and I don't. I mean, the thing is, people always say this to me, oh, you're a very confident person, so yeah. you're, you're all right. As a, as a teenager, mm. I was riddled with self-doubt um when i could walk with a limp i you know it i just couldn't believe that anyone fancied me an occasion but i would thought well what i always thought what's the worst that can happen well they can say no so i tried and sometimes they said yes mostly they said no but that's what they do to all teenage boys uh, so it's not like you were picked on specifically and then when i became a wheelchair user while i was in hospital i very nearly died a couple of times and i and i saw other people die while i was in there and it taught me that that well, what's the worst that can happen? There are a lot worse things that can happen. And so then I did come out and think, well, I don't think anyone will go out with me, but I'd rather know than just think it. Nice. So I tried anyway, and I found that people did. And the more I did go out with people, the more I realized that, that like I said, that the majority aren't anti-disabled or pro-disabled. They're kind of, I just like people. Right. And if they like you, they like you. So I think that, yes, and it might be, you might be very shy, but you might have a really interest in art or music or sport or, you know, or trains or anything. There are loads of people like you out there. And never before have we been able to find each other. Do you know what I mean? Like I went to Comic-Con last week and, you know, I, I've always liked dressing up and I was just completely freaked out at the number of people that were really gone for it. And I thought, well, you know, that's the whole tribe of people that wouldn't give a monkeys if you were disabled. Mm. If you look great in your outfit, if you came as Professor X or, you know, whatever, the, the, what was the, the, the Batman character that's uh, a wheelchair user? I've forgotten the name, but you know, there's, there's loads of characters out there you could come. Or you could just you come as a Dalek even. Or you could come as a character and then just sit in your chair, you know, mm. or whatever. Or, or, you know, you could be a visually impaired um a Jedi, do you know what I mean? And use your lightsaber as your cane or whatever. They are going to love you. They aren't going to go, oh, well, yeah, no. And if they did, that would be because them, that person didn't, not the scene. So I, I think it's really, there's there's more to it than just disabled people get a rough deal. Right. And I think that when I was young, there wasn't that many of us shouting about this. But I think now there is, there's all, you know, people like Kelly Gordon that does uh, her podcast on Hot Octopus, you know, um, you know, what she does is amazing because she's really confronting serious, big sexual topics mm. um, from, an, from, from the fact that coming from it, from a disabled point of view, actually brings a new insight. Mm. You know, I genuinely think that the, the way my body works has taught me to enjoy relationships and sex in a much better way. Mm. And um, the other thing, of course, when I came out on television, I went, oh, yeah, no, by the way, my don't get erections, da, 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 and talked about it, and my wife was there, and we talked about it. Afterwards, all of my non-disabled friends would sidle up to me in clubs and go, it's funny that, because that keeps happening to me at the minute. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what do I do? And it was like, all of a sudden, all the people that had been talking about sex and oh, I did that to her were, were, were later on coming up and going, oh, we share that experience. And then I thought, well, actually, this has taught me that Non-disabled people have all the same issues we do. It's just they're really bad at talking about it. Um, so, That's great. you know, there is a positive to it. We we aren't the norm. 
we are different and that can be a wonderful thing and I've always enjoyed being the weirdo so maybe that's it it's not the confidence I've got it's just the fact that I like being different <laughs> okay one one last area to yeah. think about I mean it's great to get your take on the whole thing what about the way that the media portrays us, particularly the film uh, and television, particularly in drama? I mean, the, we've had more documentaries. You've made some of them. There have been more. But it's really still quite hard to challenge the stereotypes that are built in, hardwired into I, drama and film. Yeah. You know, how, I, I, how do that we do I think is our that? Big, that, I think, is the biggest... I think that drives a lot of the ignorance that you fa that you face as a disabled person when it comes to sex and relationships. I mean, films like You Before Me, yes. or Me Before You, or whatever it bloody was called, I don't know, uh, and that book, and yeah, that all that idea that you know, uh, there's a multi-millionaire, you know, wheelchair user who finds a beautiful girl and falls in love with her, him while he lives in his adapted castle with his jet that takes him to a beach hut that he can, that's fully accessible. And yet life still isn't worth living and she's better off without him is probably more damaging than anything. Yes. Um, and I think it's so sad. And, you know, when, when Liz Carr was in um, Silent Witness and had, mm -hmm a relationship and her husband was just a husband and they just loved each other and that was it. Mm -hmm. And there wasn't any big disabled thing, yeah. you know, then um, I thought that was a counterpoint. The problem is it's me before you or whatever it's called was a big budget film and you don't see it, you know, and if it does happen, if you know, Oh, there's a disabled guy in sex education. Or so, what it's sort of still, Oh, wow. And that good. Look what we're doing as opposed to being truthful. And like I said, most people I know who are disabled are in happy relationships. Um, you know, they're either having fun or they're in a relationship. Most are married, if I'm truthful, because I'm at that age. And most yeah. have kids, you yeah. know. Um, and we don't see that. You, you just don't do it. Um, so we're still at that point where if a story was told about, uh, you know, a disabled uh, uh, a couple um, and they had kids um, and they, when one of them was disabled or whatever, it would be big news. And I think that's sad that, you know, we're still at that point. Well, and where... we've still got social services knocking on the door mm. saying that we, we are a threat to our children. If yeah. Yeah. You know, two I... disabled people have a child, that, that can often happen, you know. Yeah, I think... Our protection issues... I mean, to be to be truthful, I I, I think I, I know I'm lucky because uh, I mean, one I can't have kids, so no one's ever knocked on my door. But I think also I I am able to argue my corner. I am able to go out, and I have, like I said, decided that that you know this idea that you know if someone says no, that's their problem. If someone says yes, hooray, kind of thing. And uh, you know it hasn't really ever got to me, and I think but there's a lot going on in society that probably I think a lot of people like me don't necessarily experience, but I think that still doesn't mean that someone like myself shouldn't be talking. And I think that, that it's kind of why I won't shut up. And I know it's kind of for any young people watching, I know it's a bit disgusting to think of someone of our age having sex, <laughs> but we do. <laughs> and I think that, uh, that's the thing, you know, there'll be new young people, like I said, like Kelly, like Lucy Dawson coming up. And I think it's really good that the next, the new generation of people confronting this tend to be yeah. women. Yeah. Um, but I think that people like, I mean, to be honest, I'm now finding myself at more events talking about sex and age than I am talking about sex and disability. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's great getting old. But I think that, you know, again, it, it, that's another subject that intersects. The, the idea, if you excuse the pun, that that disabled people have sex, Ooh, old people have sex, Ooh, we all have sex. Yeah. And that's one of the joys of life and of being happy. So I think that, yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on, but again, that comes from stereotypes. And I think that social services believe what they, everyone believes what they see in the media. The media can mm. do amazing things. If you portrayed disabled people having children and everyone being happy more, then people would start to think it could happen. Yeah. But you know that social services have been called by someone. Mm. So someone has said that couple can't cope. And why have they said that? Because there's no, you know, they don't know. They can't see through the walls. So it, you know, it, it must be from stereotypes. 
Having said that, I also think that society places far too much onus on families, especially of chi- young children, to care for their parents when they're disabled. And I think that's disgusting. Mm. You know, children should be allowed to be children, whatever. And parents should be given the support and the care that they need so they can be parents. Um, One last thought. So yeah. in, talking to a young disabled boy or girl, whether they've got a hidden impairment or oh, physical, yeah. looking back on your interesting life, what would you say to them in, in a couple of sentences about how to feel about themselves and about relationships and sexuality? Look at the great things about you. Be, be confident in the fact that you are the person you are. And know that that means there'll be someone out there for you. Um, and, and, and look into people with your impairment who are older, because you will find that there's a lot of us out here who are happy and are, it's becoming more common for people to actually recognize and be diagnosed and come out about being a member of our community. And you'll see that this myth of, that you aren't going to be happy is completely rubbish. 